Hello, and welcome to Beauty in the Biz, where we talk about the business and marketing side of plastic surgery. I'm your host, Katherine Maley, author of Your Aesthetic Practice, What Your Patients Are Saying, as well as consultant to plastic surgeons to get them more patients and profits. Now, I have a really special guest today. It's Dr. Sam Lamb. It's Samuel Lamb, but I just love his name, Sam Lamb. Can't miss that. Now, he's a board-certified facial plastic and reconstructive surgeon with 20 years of experience and in private practice in Plano, Texas, where he's from, actually. So Dr. Lamb completed his undergrad degree at Princeton and his medical degree at Baylor College of Medicine. Then he trained for six years in head and neck surgery at Columbia University in New York. And then he completed a fellowship in facial plastic and reconstructive surgery, as well as hair restoration. Now, Dr. Lamb has written over 250 articles, book chapters, and eight major medical textbooks, including the first textbook series on hair transplantation. So Dr. Lamb lectures and directs hair transplant courses all over the world. He's been featured on CNN, CBS, ABC, Fox, and many other media channels. I met him many years ago. He's been on the podium forever around the world talking about marketing. He's a really good marketer, by the way. So we're gonna dive into the business side of your practice, Dr. Lamb. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Catherine. I appreciate it. I'm glad to be here. Oh, that's fantastic. So why facial plastic surgery? I always wondered that because when I was growing up, I never heard of facial plastic surgery. I heard of plastic surgery, but how did you land on facial plastic surgery? Well, it was uh, it was actually during my uh, otolaryngology residency that uh, a guy, uh, Gene Tardy, who was my mentor, Ed Williams's mentor, and he came in a very patrician guy, very well dressed, and he started talking about rhinoplasty. And I'm an artist at heart; I paint every day, and I just like, wow, this is beautiful. I mean, my whole life is driven by beauty, and so even now, 20 years out, I'm probably one of the few guys that do, does his own injections as well as his own uh, surgery um, because I just I'm just passionate about all of it. I, you know, for me, it's it, it took me from a position where I was doing the same procedures over and over again. And then now every, every patient is different in you. Okay. So what was your, just quickly, what was your journey from you graduate, you did your fellowship, you're out. And how did you enter the marketplace? Did you go to a hospital? Did you go solo right away? How was that journey? Well, I had a very nice cushion. And unfortunately, from the business side of, of things, it's, it's, it's obviously um, not something everyone can get. I, I was literally in, and not figuratively, literally my dad's toilet. So my dad was a family doctor and he had a toilet that I, I needed I needed to uh, have an office. So he took it out and that was my office. So it was very nice because I lived at home. I wasn't married and, and he basically, uh, they covered my staff, covered everything. And I was in a very small office for a fam, you know, family doctor in, in Richardson, which is an area that has mainly Asians. I trained a, a few months after my fellowship to learn about Asian cosmetic surgery. And the Asians came in and they said, oh, this guy is affordable, which is perfect for me. And other people that were um, that that were not Asian were like, this guy, I I, I don't think he can know, he knows what he's doing. So I started with him for a couple of years. My mom, who was really a um, is ne was never a developer, but she is the brains and the vision and the uh, the trust in me as a person that I'd even trust uh, and built this at the time it was twenty seven thousand square foot wellness building that became forty five thousand square feet. Um, and that's another thing we can talk about. But she really, I would love to take credit for it, but she's the one that built that. And so that's how that in about two years morphed into an an amazing, insane center that I would love to take credit for, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we're going to talk about it, but you have to go on his website, lambfacialplastics.com and check out the tour. It's, it's quite impressive. Yeah, it's right up there with like one of the best I've ever seen. Um, so how did you divvy up the services? Because you, are you still doing reconstructive at all? Not, not anymore. I, I leave the reconstructive on my website only because it's People love to see that as long as there's a little tag of warning of, yeah, it could be a little graphic. And I, when I started my practice, uh, I said, look, and when I didn't have a lot of rhinoplasty before and after, is I said, look, I could put a nose back on the face and then go, okay, sold. I'll, I'll, do, I'll, let, I'll let you do my nose. So uh, no, not a lot of recons anymore, you know, some keloids and things like that, but mainly it's cosmetic. Then how do you divvy up your time? Because you are getting so well known for rhino, but you also do bleph, I'm, I'm sorry, for hair transplant. So you right. do a lot of hair transplantation, then some rhino, then some facelifts. How are you divvying in and you do your own injectables? So how do you divvy up your time? So the way that the, my my the 
the way the work the way that the week works is I, I Monday and Wednesday are my big hair days. Um, so I do either one big strip or FUE case, then one big one on Wednesday, and that's in the morning. I'm usually done if it's if it's a strip procedure. I'm done about ten thirty. If I'm doing FUE, I'm done about twelve thirty. Um, I and then I uh, in the afternoons will be consults, injectables, small procedures, blepharoplasties, little things in the office, whatnot. Tuesdays and Thursdays are my big face days. I do either a facelift, uh, uh, rhinoplasty, uh, um, fat graft, bluff, whatever may be bigger procedures on those two days. Thursdays, I may switch out with a hair or I, or vice versa. I may fill in a, uh, a, a face on a Thursday, uh, on a, on a Wednesday. So these are just, uh, there's a little bit of flexibility. Um, and then the afternoons, the same thing, small procedures. Um, and then Fridays are my non-surgical days. I usually don't do any big surgeries on that day. And I just, I just, the day just fills in, to be honest with you. I just go back and forth do a little bit here and there and run back and forth. Do you have a preference for the procedures you like the most? I love it all. I, I love it all. I mean, you know, I, I just, everything is for me is creative and fun. And I just, the way, you know, for me, I find that people, they oftentimes surgeons give up the injectables. They, you know, I understand that from a money perspective, you get someone else to do it. It makes sense, but I love it. And I find that there's so much overdone fillers and great facelifts and that it, it doesn't look right or vice versa. You get really good fillers and bad surgery and doesn't look right. So I look at myself as sort of Apple Inc. I mean, I control the end to end user experience. So I, my patients look good when they come out. I only things I don't do is like IPL and, you know, microneedles and stuff like that, but anything that requires an artistic eye and control, I, I do it all. So your business model, you've got yeah. 45,000 square feet of facility that is remarkable. It's got like more than one uh, water fountain or water flow that, oh dear Lord, it's a place is gorgeous, but somebody has to pay for all of that. So yeah. as far as I can tell on your website, you look like the only revenue generator. So who's on your team helping you make money? Well, for my for my center, it is mainly me. To be honest with you, it's probably not the best business model, but it's a business model that works for me because obviously I know people do better with 10 injectors and everything. Now, I have people that do all the non-invasive little small things as we talked about. There's a lot, I've got a lot of lasers. They do all those things. I don't do any of the, the little laser things. But the vast majority of the revenue comes from me. Now, there are things like we do this thing called hair stem, which basically it's an infusion therapy instead of PRP that helps with stimulating hair. Um, there are a lot of little things that are, I, I can't even name so many little things, but they do all that. But the vast majority of the profit still comes in my, from my hands. How, how can you, your overhead must be insane. Well, let me clarify the 45,000 square feet is not mine. I have about 10,000. Okay. So, so I've got a, a spa that I, I lease to that's, you know, uh, pretty large, six, 7,000. I've got a, a huge uh, salon that's across the way. I've got a dentist. I've got um, a marriage counselor. I've got a person that does Eastern cupping medicine. I've got these med suites that's about 6,000 square feet that, that has Ayurvedic medicine, uh, hair systems. Um, I've got, I can't even think of it. So many different things. So th those are all tenants. Okay. So are you the owner of the building? Yes. Yeah. And they're okay. So that's actually an incredibly interesting business model, but do you have any control over any of them or are they just, because I look at them as alliances. They're a, a beautiful sure. feeder to you, to right. what you're doing, or are they? Has it turned out to be like a reciprocal? But not, not as much as, so I tell, you know, from a business perspective, I tell young people coming into this, don't over-focus on that being such an essential element. There's a few reasons. So first of all, we're all in it for ourselves. We're driving ourselves. And so, yeah, I send people there. They send me people. I wouldn't say it's necessarily more than from external sources. And then, of course, if you've got a salon in your, your space, other salons may feel like, oh, I, they're not going to send me people or vice versa. So, so it's not necessarily the most beneficial relationship. I look at it as just a long-term uh, equity play to exit. Um, and you know, a lot of people are trying to sell their business in a way I don't even have to, I can retire in my building. So, so that is, if you look at it from a long-term equity play, it's great. If you worried about trying to cross, uh, cross feed each other. Yeah. Okay. But it's not great. I, and then, and then I, I made some mistakes along the way. I, I owned, uh, the Jose Vera salon that was in my place and I didn't revenue a lot. And it was great because in the sense I, I learned never to do that again. 
Um, and I learned that I'm, I just, it's not my blue flame. It's not the area that I am good at. I don't have the time to manage it. And I own the spa. I, I didn't make much money on the spa. And, um, and, and so now that someone else is, that owns like eight centers in Dallas, they do it. And, and it, when I was initially starting, I was worried about having um, a, you know, having someone else doing Botox in my building. Now I've got multiple people doing it. I don't care because I, I've established myself and my, my med spa offers it. It's, and I don't even own the med spa. They, they do their own thing. If they don't refer to me because of it, I'm busy enough right now that I'm not so worried there. I, I'm looking this, that I own the building or my mom owns the building, to be honest with you. It's, it's, it's to be clear and, and, and the future I'll own it. But that is something that doesn't worry me. That is so interesting. So you don't have to manage these people. They all have their own separate LLCs or whatever. So when you sell, yeah, you're not, you can't sell all of it. You can only sell your piece of the practice and everyone else, all the no, no. So this is not a condo. It's not a condo. It's a, they're, they're paying rent. So they don't own any of this. I, I I will own the whole building and the real estate, everything. So there, so when someone purchases it from me, they're buying everything. They're not having to worry about condos at all. Interesting. Wow. That's wow. Oh, do you have any plans? Like how I, you're certainly too young to even think about exiting, well, but do you have any no, plans? Yeah. I mean, eventually what I want to do is, uh, is sell out and I'll rent from, I'll rent from the owner you know, because, uh, and I'm fine with that, you know, so I, my exit is not, I'm not so, I'm, I, I'm not so worried that I have to exit my business. I, I make enough revenue from what I do. I'm looking at the building as my exit. Right. I, the real estate, right? Right. It's the, it's the real estate, right. There's, there's so much equity and built up in that after all those, all, after years go by, my gosh. Yeah. I think that's a brilliant idea, by the way, the real estate, just like McDonald's, it's not about the hammer, it's about but the real also, estate. But I also tell people too, and are we talking about the business side or is that if I dive too fast into that? Uh, so the, so the, the, the thing is, I would, I, I would caution people when they hear that to say, oh man, I'm going to go get this big building and I'm going to do all that. The, the, the very honest truth is you can do really well by investing in something else. You don't have to, you can invest in some other real estate. You can invest in some other um, business. You don't have, it doesn't have to be yours. A lot of doctors have this mental idea, and including me, that we have to own where we work. I think if we can divorce the concept and say, look, if, if it works for you and you got the prime place to where you want to be and it all makes sense, do it. Otherwise, don't worry so much. Even if you lease or rent for 10 or 20 years, if you're making good revenue here and you've got a better business proposal somewhere else to exit on, do that. I think they get such peace of mind from it. Um, I know um, just being a homeowner, I just have a lot of peace of mind that nobody can kick me out. I yes. control my destiny there. And um, and it's like a little ATM machine if you ever need it, the equity is there. So um, I see why they do that. And be, especially in today's world, I don't know how many young guys can join you and buy you out. I mean, I don't like who's going to buy you out, I, you know? That's that's exactly the case. And so that's why I'm not quite as worried about that exit, which is a different mindset you know my my building is my exit it's not now of course i'm going to have someone come in and groom and and build into the thing or maybe it goes to vc at some point i don't even know but um right, right now i'm not so worried about that exit as as important as as the other component what about the surgical center is it is it as big of a deal as the uh as the office looks like how many suites do you have well, so for, for the surgery center, I started with only one because it was for me. And so what I do now is I have sort of two. And so let me explain what sort of means. I do one of the rooms is I, I build for my hair, hair, hair transplants. I don't need general anesthesia for it. It is completely um, med gas ready to go. And so what happens is I have a, a plastic surgeon that does body work, um, does some face, but it basically does like 99% body work. And he comes in and the days I do hair in that in the hair room, he uses the the surgery center to do the body stuff. Um, and then, you know, if in the future, if I get busy enough or I want to exit on that, or I want to sell this as a surgery center, then I can easily, basically it's ready. It's, it's ready to get, it's gassed. I just need to put in a, um, a general anesthesia machine to do that if someone wants to do that. So as a separate entity, as a profit center, profit center to sell that out right now, it's not built in for that. Um, it would make a lot of sense. I did have discussions with the plastic surgeon to come in as a tenant and and to buy over time some shares on the surgery center. You know, a lot of uh, physicians are very risk adverse. They just don't see that as something that makes sense. But 
it's a no brainer for me for where he was going to come in and do that. But, you know, it's, I, I'm not sweating it, you know? So that plastic surgeon, your business arrangement with him, is it, is it completely it's safe time. to rent some space and that's it? Or do you have a, a relationship? No, he just comes in and uses my, my center. And so I, he's just using dead, dead air, so to speak, you know? Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've seen it go both ways. I've seen the surgeons who have put millions into a multi-suite OR thinking that the surgeons in the area will come to him, you know, to come do surgery there. That was way more difficult than they ever expected. Um, yeah. They had they had to go out of their like the plastic surgeons wouldn't come. So they had to go with orthopedic surgeons or I mean, they, they scrambled, you know, to build a time there. And it was just one more big headache that you had to manage. So um, I've just heard such mixed reviews. Like sometimes they were sorry they ever got involved and they should have just kept it small. Um, like any thoughts about that? You know, I mean, to be honest with you, you need to have good people working around you to help you. So if you are going to do that, the problem with cosmetic work is you don't it, it, you don't make money on that from a surgery center. You need, if you really want to make money on a surgery center, you need insurance. And the problem with that, that's a whole different level. And it depends on what level you want to take it. Um, a friend of mine uh, does bariatric work. He's got a great surgical facility that does all the insurance stuff. For him, it makes sense because he does insurance. But if you're a cosmetic guy, I, I think if you are, unless, it, if you want to go into the surgery center business, then you got to go into it from an insurance perspective. If you really want to put plastic surgeons together, too many egos going around. There's no compensation at the level of a, of a surgery facility. Um, it just makes no sense to me. Well, I did watch um, somebody in California uh, many years ago, he he was in by like, six million building the place out. As he's building, California took away all the insurance for um, rest reduction uh -huh. and um, and workers comp and all of that. It just changed overnight. And he's like, "Crap, <laughs> what am I going to do?" Uh, and that really hurt a lot. And then somebody else came in and decided to do all the transgender. And yeah. in California, I couldn't believe this, but they were like. A transgender patient um, was insured by up to 100 grand for, you know, um, whatever it is, um, whatever you call it, gender reunification. Right. Gender affirmation surgery, yeah. Yeah, and it, it's a huge business. So it just depends, you know, like where, where you want to go with that. But it did, it completely destroyed his cosmetic side mm -hmm. because it's a completely different world. It's a different patient. It's a different emotional um, background and um, and it, it, the two did not gel at all. But when you just take that piece of it, the transgender part of that, I've watched yeah. some practices just crush it. You know, there's it's so many there's so many right answers and wrong answers to everything. Yeah, yeah. For sure. So do you, are, do you plan on ever like bringing in another person, another? No, no. I I actually have the physical space for it now. I just don't have the bandwidth. Uh, the problem, honestly, is several things. Number one is. Um, staffing has been a nightmare the last two years. Um, just trying to make sure that I'm I'm having enough staffing for me has already been very difficult. So until that part of the equation is solved, the answer is no. The other thing to me right now is, um, you know, there's I I need to find. I think you know Ed always told me Ed Williams always told me he says don't bring someone on board unless you're willing to slow down. Um, yeah or exit on it. And I'm not either one. I, I really love what I do. And I, I don't run a crazy business where I have to do, I am running all over the place, but I, I don't do, I do like two to three transplants a week, two to three major surgeries a week and a ton of small ones. And then of course, a ton of injectables and I'm happy. So I just don't have the room or bandwidth to have someone come in right now, you know, maybe in the future. For sure. But it sounds like also you're trying to do work-life balance. Um, you know, you're not, you're not going to kill yourself doing this. Um, and, and I'm so glad you know that because some do and they're, I don't know if this made them any happier, but they're grinding, you know, they've, they've been grinding for 20 years. So I, you know, the answer is whatever's right for you, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, gosh. All right. So we have to talk about, um, actually, let's just talk about staffing for a second. Sure. It has been universally the biggest issue ever. It always was an issue. Like, isn't staffing like your biggest challenge of running a practice? But yeah. now due to whatever has happened in the world, it's just gotten so difficult to find people, not find people, good people, you know, who want to work and who are dedicated. So any tips on what has been working for you? I have an amazing director who manages all this, first of all. So I don't. Um, and uh, of course, it's, 
the thing is, she's so well connected in the community. She finds a lot of friends of friends. Of course, that's the best way to get um, mm -hmm. people here. But that's not even enough. It's too still too dry. Um, of course, Indeed has worked really well for us. Uh, but there is no easy way to do it. Uh, it is it is a slog. And I, I I wish I could give you a good tip that would be a pearl, but no, there isn't. <laughs> it's enough. Well, didn't everybody, I think um, half of the state of California left because we're so crazy here right now. Um, and a lot of them went to Texas. So did you yeah. feel a big rush of Californians coming over? Yeah. I mean, from a real estate perspective, they've all come here to take over homes and things like that. So from a business perspective, it definitely has, has helped us. Um, I mean, I think that everyone has felt a really good um, plus, I mean, not everyone, but a lot of people have felt a really good plus during the pandemic time. But now, as inflation soars and everything else is going up, there's definitely been uh, a drop in the last six months. And I think things are trending and not in a good way, but everything's a cycle. I mean, I, I'm not so worried long-term. People want facelifts, people want hair transplants and and I, it's just little bumps in the road, you know? It, and it is cycles. Um, we were both around for the recession and um, the comeback and all the crazy that goes on, but um, it's very cyclical and it just is. Um, so let's talk about marketing because I used to say, hmm, how do you, could you possibly differentiate yourself from everybody else? Number one, your building is killer. That is unbelievable. How long did it take to build that thing? Two years. <laughs> it's, I, it's amazing. Um, did you have that vision? Like the and you call it something like the wellness center, right? Well, you know, I had a vision for the wellness center, but I it really I I would love to sound like an arrogant person and to come up with this, but my mom is an amazing business person, and you should interview her, not me, I guess. But, yeah. but she she really honestly um, had a lot of trust in me and to do this, and we built a lot of the stuff at a time where you know, like right now, building is build anything is crazy. I mean, it's, it's, you don't, you want to, you know, buy low and sell high. And I mean, I, of course, if someone's building right now, go for it. It's, it's, it's great, but my God, it's, it's a tough time. And we just built at a very low time. I mean, the land was dirt cheap here. Um, this in 2001, you know, it was uh, uh, just after some, uh, after 9-11, uh, there was some depression in the marketplace. The uh, the Tobmans who owned the uh, the mall across the way that is had been up and down and still up and down, unfortunately, right now with COVID post post COVID, they wanted to to get rid of stuff and and so it, we just be we're just very lucky that Texas is, is has grown so much. But the thing with real estate too is that it it's not a surefire bet. It's not that just because you think well it's real estate it's real and then you're you're going to grow not every area grows you know and not everything multiplies in huge degrees so there is risk with that you know um but we're just very blessed that the area we chose was like amazing it's the, the huge corridor of growth right here for sure um i did own some single family homes in austin texas yeah. before of course i sold at the wrong time but i, I it was um there's no money in that, quite frankly. They, there was no equity like you can build out here in California. Like, like it just, it, and it was difficult to manage. But um, I just remember thinking, wow, this place, it's so dirt cheap to buy real estate away right. from California. Um, sure. But then when you sell, well, now they're the place, I mean, actually, one of the houses, like the houses were, um, they, during COVID, they jumped up to like over 400,000 than what I had bought it for. And it's like, Gosh darn it! I didn't see that coming at all. But here was the big, the big one for Texas is they get you on the property taxes. Oh, of course. So, like my property taxes like tripled one year, and I thought, wait a yeah. second, I didn't account for that. And so it just did financially, it didn't make sense. But do you find that the because somebody's got to pay for all of this stuff somewhere along? Yes, the yes. No, property tax is terrible in Texas. There's no doubt. Um, get someone to negotiate it for you. That's pretty obvious. Um, I've got, I've got someone negotiates my. Commercial I've, and the same guy negotiates my home and everything is negotiable. So nice. that's that's actually a good rule for everything. Everything's negotiable. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> By the way, what's your commute like from your home to your office? In the morning, it's uh, eight to 12 minutes and home, it is 12 to 30 minutes. <laughs> and it's it the 30 minutes has really gotten crappy now because um, sometimes I just deal with traffic. I never had to deal with that. I don't know what's going on, but uh I, I um, you know, Tony Robbins calls it um, no extra time or net. 
And I learn languages when I drive home. I do audiobooks. And I fortunately, I, I mean, I, I can absolutely concentrate and learn a language, but I don't like wasting time. So I, you know, I don't even feel the commute. Uh, I, I just think um, as I get older, um, commuting, commuting has become, I, I won't do it. I just, I, I just, I think it's not good for your peace of mind or your productivity or your, um, just your, I just, it's just so nice. I mean, I, I've noticed also surgeons will start moving closer. There's a book by Jonathan Haidt called The Happiness Hypothesis. Uh, he said that it's actually the farther you live from your, it's directly related how farther you live from your, uh, your workplace and the longer your commute, the less happy you are. <laughs> oh, isn't that true? Although, you know, now we all listen to podcasts all the time. I can listen to those all day long. I still don't like b- being forced to sit still. That, that's my, I'm just too ABD about that. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so um, so regarding marketing, you were, yeah. you were one of the very first people I ever met who got into video. And yes. we were at the medical conferences, been going to those for years. And you always had your camera up there. And I thought, good for you. And you yeah. were, you got really good at it. And you were the only one doing it. And then now the whole world has jumped in and they're doing it. But how much did that help you to be uh, at the still the, all that? All of it does. All of it does. I, I think that, you know, I'm definitely not the leader anymore of this of this space. People are doing great work that I, I'm not doing that. But there's no doubt that on a daily basis, it's the uh, it's the videos, the podcasts, the just patients getting to know you. I mean, just, you know, you you know, and the great thing is lecture, like lecturing and filming your, I film my own lectures. That's the many huge thing. People just go, Oh my God, this guy is such an authority, but I come across pretty good on, on stage. And so, you know, if, if you're, if you're not a good lecturer or you're nervous or something, then of course that is not good. But, you know, I feel very, if people feel the authenticity as you talked about, uh, as you, as you've, as you have talked about that, that is an important element and there's just a connection. So videos are still critical, you know? Mm-hmm. So what's working for you? I, your Instagram looks fantastic. Your YouTube channel looks fantastic. Although on YouTube, it definitely looks like you're doing hair transplantation. Like, yeah. I, are you, is it meant to be that? Like, are you trying to, I can't tell if you're like trying to get away from facelifts and rhino or, or like putting all your eggs in the hair basket. You know, it's, I, here's the thing it, from a lecture perspective, I, I just, you, what happens is in the world of lecturing you get boxed into a certain category and you like, am I, am I doing huge advances in uh, neck lifts? No, I'm following what Mike Nyag is doing with, uh, with neck work. And so I, I get podcasts about that. I talk about it, but I am not, I don't feel comfortable going on stage and say, look, I've innovated something. Whereas with hair, I am always on podium. You know, I have written now so many books on hair transplant um, and I just am having another one come out next year. So for me, I think a lot of it may read that way because of the academic stuff. But the one thing that I will say is that, you know, with long tail strategies of just putting videos up there, people are searching stuff and whatever comes up, they feel, figure that's what you're, what you do. And so I'm not so worried about a composite location where they have to follow you. But when someone follows, finds something that I, for example, uh, recently I've been doing a lot of osteomas. And people find me because of all my videos on osteoma. They don't care how to do hair. They don't care how to do a facelift, but they find me because they're looking for the word osteoma. They're looking for the word bone on the forehead or bony lesion on the forehead. And and so I think that if, so long as I keep throwing different things out there, it's great. But sometimes, you know, there's a lot more stuff about hair because I have a lot of, I do a lot of hair and I'm always on podium for that. You know. Well, um, there's something else you do that's really smart. I look at um, websites and digital presence from the consumer point of view. And if I was somewhere and I saw um, I wanted to talk about uh, a facelift and when I click on facelift, when you show up, you send me to a Web page that's all about facelift and it has everything there. It has before and after photos. It explains things. It has diagrams. It has many videos of you. It has video testimonials about facelift. You're not making me click all over the place. I don't have to go to galleries. Then I have to go to video testimonials. Then I have to go to learn more about the procedure. It was all there on one page. And I do, I tell everybody, you guys make this easy for the consumer. Give them what they want in one shot because they're not going to click like they used to, you know? So whoever's doing your website, I think they are doing it. 
that was my idea. <laughs> oh, there you go. Brilliant. So the recent thing I just recently did is I, I had shot about it a couple of years ago, what are what I call virtual consultations, where I just I basically the same thing I say every day. Um, and now I move that up to the front of the page because that's really the, you know, where people want to know like what is a procedure, what's recovery, what's the what's the risk, what's the limitation, what are the goals? Anyway, so I, I've now flagged that as my top one. And then everything follows from there. And I've and the other thing I've done with before and afters, which I've tried to do, um, is uh, people want, they don't want to go to a new page. They want to scroll. So what I've done with my before and afters is I have one page scroll for like, if it's rhinoplasty or whatever it may be, you just keep scrolling down. And in that way, you, you don't, you if you want to stop, you stop. And then what I've done with before and afters is they're swiping left and right. So now you basically, what's well, a tap, it, the swipe didn't work as well, but you, you go through all your videos and everything related to that one patient on, on a horizontal bar. And then vertically there, it's all in that one category. Of course, I've also got subcategories. So if you're looking for um, ethnic hair restoration, ethnic rhinoplasty, whatever it may be that's specific, you, you'll go into dive deep into that category as well, besides a general one. But that whole you know, finger left to right and up and down has also been helpful. Oh, that's fantastic. By the way, you have 600 videos, but 6,000 before and after photos and more patient video testimonials than I've ever seen. How are you making that happen when everybody else says, oh, my patients are so private, they won't talk about this. How, how do you make that happen? So first of all, I, I'm a good salesperson, so I'm the one in charge of it. So basically what happens is um, the way I first look, I have the patient, I have the staff put up the before and after for me before I walk in the room. If it looks mind blowing, I'll walk into the uh, patient's room and say, wow, you got to see this before and after. It's amazing. So they'll see it. And then I'll ask, the, the, just like if you want to date a girl, you, if you don't ask, you don't go out with her. So, or a guy, whatever it is. So I, I asked the patient, would you um, mind to, to do this? And if they say, well, I don't know. Usually at that point, I ask the simple question, is it privacy? Um, or what is, or what's the reason? If they say it's privacy, I, I don't, I don't push a testimonial, whatever it may be. So let's say they say yes. So then from that, yes, I go to, um, I go to, well, then you do a video where you do a review where you do all these things so I can capture all of it and then use it in all different platforms. If it is a, no, it's a privacy issue. Then I ask, will you do a review? Can I use part of the image? How about, what if I, if it's otoplasty, can I black out your face and just use the ears? Uh, can I do, uh, you know, if it's a hair, can I just do the hairline? Can I just do the eyebrows? Can I just do the eyes? Can I do the nose with the eyes blacked out? I try to negotiate what privacy allows. Um, and then if it goes toward the yes, I can use before and after is, of course, the natural question I just mentioned is, uh, can I shoot a video? And they'll usually tell me, they may tell me, no, I'm not ready. I don't accept that. I, I will, what I do is I just take, now I just use my phone and I take a little plug-in thing um, with a um, uh, uh, wired mic to the US to the, the lightning cable, uh, clip it on them and put it on cinematic mode so the background's blurred, hold it up this way and just shoot it. So I'm ready to roll because, and I, and I tell them this, I say, uh, this is the way I coach them. I'll say, pretend uh, I'm your best friend, Susan, or whatever your best friend's name is. And I'm scared to do this procedure. I'm interested. I don't know about it. Talk about why you wanted this done. What is, you know, how, what was the experience with the staff? What was the experience with the surgery? How was the discomfort recovery? What did you feel about it? What do you think about your results? How's it changed your life now? Um, and I said, you can say all that, or you don't have to say any of it. Just don't worry about it. And if you forget something, uh, I will crop it, cut it. And, and they never forget. And if they do, then at the end, if, let's say they'll say something. And then I, I stop the filming and then they say, Oh man, you know what I forgot it is I, I wanted to say how lovely your patient coordinator was. She just really made me feel. I said, okay, hold on a second. I'll take the, the phone. I'll say, okay, start with this. Say, you know, I forgot to mention something and then say what you want to say. And then I'll just splice it on iMovie and I'll stick in a, a before and after onto my thing and just upload it myself. Um, now, um, the big pearl there is you ask, you ask, you don't um, delegate or advocate, <laughs> you, you ask. The patient's much more likely to say yes to you than somebody else in your practice. And you're making it very easy for them to do that. 
I will tell you though, people who are not used to video, they, they get scared when something is put in front of their face. So I would try to come up with, I don't know, maybe like a big whiteboard with five things. Like, um, this is what the pain is, what I was in, like the pain I was in. This is why I chose Dr. Lamb. This is why you're going to want to choose him. Um, this is what my journey was like with the staff and the, and the surgery. And this is how great I feel now. And I wish I had done it sooner. If you could somehow like give them a few pointers, um, in other practices, what they've done is they, they're, um, interviewing them. So they'll, you know, how, when you do an interview, the, the reporter says, so, um, I'm going to ask you. Oh, so how did you hear about Dr. Lamb? And then I say, oh, I heard about Dr. Lamb through da, da, da. So a lot of them just need some coaching that they're just scared, you know? So, um, I, you know, if you can help them with that, but whatever you're doing is working because I've never seen so many video testimonials. Very good. You know, you know what's interesting is that they, they tell me they're scared and they need yeah. a script or something and they never need one. They just go for it. Yeah. And it's really interesting that, and the other thing I'm worried about with any pointer pointed stuff is if their eyes dart off yeah. it looks like they're reading a script right i really want them to be focused on that and i tell them look the thing that makes it easy is they'll i'll hear that i'll hear the complaint that hey i'm nervous i don't do this and i'll say look pretend you're talking to your friend i love that and i will edit it don't worry about it just yeah. keep talking just tell me and i'll say you know what it, and this is the other thing i'll say i'll say it can be 10 seconds it can be 10 minutes talk about whatever you want to talk about i've given you some ideas if you don't want to talk about the recovery, don't talk about it. Talk about, you know, what did you, what, pretend you're having a conversation with your friend. You don't need a cue card for that. Just say, you know, why did you want this done? And how's it changed your life? And those are the words I say, how does it change your life? And then that usually gets them clicked in. And they're so emotional about it. They'll just go off. And what that fear level is, it goes away, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, what's the timing on that? Because I have watched practices wait too long. Um, yeah. there's a, there's a, a sweet spot when a cosmetic patient has been transformed and they're totally emotionally attached to it. And then there's the point where they, they, they're used to it now. And so the, the emotion is gone or the passion, like it was there. Is there a certain time frame? The, the time frame is always. And, uh, and so let me explain is it like, you know, sometimes the patient doesn't follow up with you. So what you thought was going to be a good time is not. And people want to see a patient a day out. They want to see a week out. They want to hear from them all over the time. So when I, if, if I like the before and after, that's usually one, if, if I, if that's usually one of the catalysts that I have, the other catalyst is just thinking about it, thinking, you know what, this is a really personal person. Let's just do it. Or if the person's from out of town, um, um, it's like, let's just shoot it right now. And, and sometimes what I'll do is like, I had a guy this week, I, I just put on a hair transplant one. I remembered him doing a video. So I already got the consent. I already knew he, he was comfortable. They already told me how great the experience was. So um, I went and he was six months out. He had a lot of hair growth at that point already. So what I, when did I shoot the first one? A day after the procedure. And so when did I shoot this one? Six months out. I could shoot another one at, at one year. So that same patient is giving me at least two, three, four um, uh, te uh, testimonials. So it's endless. You know, and then that is a great long tail because it gets splattered all over the, the internet. For sure. Um, the um, in the reviews, do you handle that the same way, or do you do that differently? Are you are you asking for everything all at the same time? Like I, I, I usually do. My staff usually handles a review. I I don't. I'm not necessarily 100 percent happy with the way that I'm in taking the reviews. To be honest with you, so I can't 100 percent advocate it. But we use a little doctor.com thing where they type in a little review and. I don't know if I don't even I haven't checked my reviews. I probably should, but um, you have enough. You have like two hundred and fifty or something. You have a good rating. Yeah, good. I don't even know to be honest. That's terrible to say that because I should know everything, but I don't check it because uh, sometimes make a bad one or whatever. And that uh, right, you know. And I just, I don't, you know. I people ask, you know, how do you? I have one guy ask me, so how do you, you know, handle like um, a bad review? I said, look, I I don't read it. <laughs> I just live my life and do good work. And then there's going to be a bad review and those give more authenticity to the whole thing. But, you know, it's going to happen, you know? Um, I want to ask about marketing um, for different target markets because sure. that's getting more and more difficult to be the best at a rhino, the best at a facelift, the best at tra hair transplantation. How do you, how do you figure out the branding of all of that? Because 
you can, when you specialize, you can charge more. People will come in from all over the world because you're the best at that one thing. And you've done that really a good job with that with hair transplant. But is that what you wanted? Or how do you market to the young rhino patient, but then turn around and market to the man who needs hair? Then how do you turn around and uh, the more mature woman who needs a facelift? Those are such different target markets. How are you handling that? For me, it's always been the video because, as I said, people, it's Google just sticks them up there. And then when you see a, a, a 36 year old deep neck lift, people relate to it. And whether it's on Instagram or somewhere else, but people just they, they, they relate to the story. They relate to the before and after. They relate to the person. And then they just find more like that. Their brain naturally procl- you know, has a proclivity to find people like themselves. So that's one thing. Um, and, uh, you know, I divide my website into those, those ethnic divisions, uh, you know, uh, African rhinoplasty and, you know, all those key terms and African hair or, um, uh, uh, I don't even remember now. Yeah. It's like traction, alopecia, black, uh, hair, um, hair loss. So I have all those, those ethnic and gender divisions on my website, but then I lump them. So I've got all male, all female. Um, and I try to split all that up and then I've got, I have a rhinoplasty website. I've got a hair website. I've got a face website. Um, and, uh, you know, soon I probably will develop a, a, a facelift website. But those micro sites that I know now is not as in, in vogue, but people want to see you're specializing something. So that helps as well. Um, and then there are universal truths, things that just make it different. Like with, with hair, I have a, a joint commission accredited facility. So I knock them out. So there's no pain. And, you know, I talk about, um, their experience being better of, of how, and just, I think the key is if you, if you're not good at speaking, public speaking, no one is to start, right? You're nervous the first time you're on stage. I'm, I was nervous the first time on stage, just keep doing it. And the more comfortable you get in front of the camera, just talking and not worrying about what you're saying and you may flub and you go, Oh my God, I forgot to say that. I'm going to say this. People feel that authenticity and they connect with you and they want to, you become this kind of pseudo celebrity and then they walk in they feel comfortable with you and that's the real connection you can have as many before and afters and and no videos you can have as much text and then without the video connection people need to connect with you before they come and see you of course you have to have before and afters you have to have great before and afters not average ones but you need to connect and there's no other way to do it than with your voice the voice is Actually, going to um, with everything going on with seo and google and apple and privacy and all of that um, video is the way in today's world to market. So anybody who is afraid of video, I always say, just do it at home. Just get the phone in front of you and the iPad in front of you. Get used to it. Like find your voice. Um, when I was much younger, I knew I was going to be a public speaker. I couldn't even say my name without forgetting it. <laughs> and I went to Toastmasters for one whole year, every yeah. Tuesday night. I went to Toastmasters in a loving group who like never criticized. We were always very positive with each other. And that's where I found my voice. And thank God, because I wouldn't be where I am today if I had not gotten over that public speaking fear. Um, no. And so it's, it's totally surmountable. You just have to do it, you know? I agree. I, I want to talk about the, the mindset part. Um, when I first met you, and I don't know if you'll remember this, but it was probably 15 years ago, and it was a Greg Morgan Ross meeting, and it was in uh, at Stanford and in California, yeah. and you were a very different person then, mm-hmm. and you were, I there is no nice way to say this, the the impression I got was so, you were so arrogant. I think you literally said to me, "You don't know who I am," uh, you know, like one of those things, and. But you were a great dancer. And and then I hadn't seen you for a couple of years. Next thing I see, I've never seen a surgeon transform as much as you had. You yeah. had lost a ton of weight. Yeah. You you had a whole new aura about you. You were smiling and engaging. And I almost didn't recognize you. And then you gave a talk. And it was about the old you <laughs> and the new you. And it yeah. had to do with you had some bad reviews. You know, do you want to just tell that story? Because that was amazing. You just became this amazing, beautiful person. 
I mean, there's so many components to evolution, right? Because I, I've evolved over 20 years of practice and, and also my life. And, um, you know, when you're, for me being Asian, I, I was picked on a lot as a kid. Um, I got in a lot of fights as a, as a teenager. Not proud of that. But, um, you know, in the 80s was a different time. I think today there's racism is much more subbtle. it's it's very under undercurrent rather than 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 basically in front of you. So um I think I had I dealt with a lot of inferiority complex about being an Asian male, my sexuality, my, you know, um whatever it may be. and uh, that confidence sometimes comes out as arrogant that in that lack of confidence comes out as arrogance when it's not meant to be. It also is, you know, a young person trying to prove himself that doesn't know his his salt um, pushes pushes the pushes things very hard, um, but yeah, bad reviews humble you. Um, I uh, had a guy that um, I did a hair transplant on, and at six months he had poor growth. Back then it was even before regenerative medicine that was available to try to uh, build faster growth, and he just said he was going to sue me for a quarter million dollars. And he's going to put a sign outside and post against everything. And I made a lot of uh, bad judgment errors at that time. I first ha- let my staff handle this situation, which is a mistake. I should have handled myself. And I know ways to, to circumvent that better now. Not 100%, obviously. But um, that was one of the issues. So it just it, it humbles you when you get slapped in the face and you start to realize, hey, you're not all that. And also... You know what? People's opinion of you are gonna fluctuate. They're gonna they think you're great or not great, and you know it's it's not um, it's not about you in in, in in many many issues with that. In terms of um, weight loss, the the honest truth is just I, I lived in New York and I walked all the time and ate like a New Yorker, and now I get moved to Texas and I ate like a Texan, and I and it was bad. I ate a lot, and I, and it was you know I just got fatter and fatter. But uh, um, it, that was, I think all of it is just this evolution of um, finding yourself. Men mature later than women, I think. You know, there's a, a component where I didn't get married. I mean, I didn't get married until my mid to late 40s and, um, you know, still trying to find myself. I don't think I was at the right spiritual, psychological, uh, emotional, physical level to get married. Whereas I think women are, are much more mature than men faster um, I have kids now, a, a four and a two year old in my early fifties. Um, and I, I'm, you know, it's great. I, I was watching the Sebastian Maniscalco thing. He says, he calls it lay and play where he lies down and, and basically as the kids run over, that's basically me because I'm old and tired. But, um, I think a large part of this is, uh, humbling yourself, you know, and realizing that, uh, that life is fun. You know, it is, it's incredible. And it's, and, and the other thing that's really important, um, you know, I'm, I'm a spiritual person. I believe God um, has given us a lot of this stuff. You know, when, when we're arrogant, we think we have so much talent. Uh, it, it's not the truth. I mean, to be honest, like I told you, look, who built this building? I could easily say like, I built it. I did it. I did this. I didn't. So why should I say that? Because I didn't. Um, and the, the truth of the matter is we're given so many opportunities, like with hair, great example, Amina Vance, who came into my life and he, she was, uh, Ed Williams, uh, she, uh, sorry, Ed's coordinator, um, was, uh, Susan Sullivan. No, uh, Ed's hair transplant coordinator at the time that he was doing a lot of hair, um, said, you got to meet this one, I mean, Vance, when you go back to Dallas. And I said, okay, whatever. I met with her and, and, but it, it turned out to be this amazing relationship over 20 years. Now she's like semi-retired, but she's working on this new book with me for next year because we're an amazing team. And, and you start to realize stuff that you suck at. And if you are transparent with that suckiness to the people around you, they know it already. You, you know, it's, it's, it's obvious. And if you try to pretend that they don't know, then it's even worse. Just know what you suck at. And for 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 her and me, we're very different. And my wife and I are very different in in really good complemented ways. I'm a really good visionary. I'm really good at uh, artistic design and understanding big pictures. I know where I need to get better. I, I can write really fast. I, I I wrote my last book in literally two months. Um, I shot a uh, hundred videos for this book in, in, in over four months, um, all with no no time at home away from my family. It's all done very, very efficiently in microseconds of time between patients. 
but uh, I'm really bad at looking at quality control, little details. Like what Amina has done, even with this textbook, for example, has come back and and just shredded it. I mean, the last book chapter on recipient site creation, I thought I was like, this is amazing. She like shredded it, redlined it, put a new diagrams like, wow. So the point of this is that we're given all these amazing relationships that in our life that make us look really good. Like, hey, I'm the hair guru, right? I just won Lifetime Achievement Award. They've only given 20 some awards out for this golden follicle. I got it. But you know what? It's because I've got an amazing team around me that has made me look amazing. It's it's not just because I'm all that in a bag of chips. So, I mean, those that's that's a long and short of it, you know. And, but didn't you also take up like yoga and meditation and um, it, like what? I did a lot. Of, you know, for me, it was very, if, yeah, my spiritual journal journey is another story, which is really interesting. So I can dive into that for a little while, you know, seeking for what's real at the end of the day. Right. So for me, yoga and meditation was a huge part of my life in my uh, mid to late thirties, early forties. Um, and then, uh, if you want to hear something weird, I, uh, I'm, I really had no faith in God at nothing. I, in my early forties, I was trying to run this, uh, uh, marathon, this half marathon. I was sick. And my, this tenant said, you know, you got to meet this guy. I'm like, well, whatever I'm sick. I don't want to meet this guy. So I, I, and he says, no, he, he doesn't, I just mind it. Come, come, you know, come meet him. They're fine. So I was lying down in this treatment room. I, my, my, I was down face down. And his partner, his like business partner was doing acupuncture on me. Uh, and then I he turns me over around and he's, he's, he's this sort of like Catholic monk type of guy. I don't know what he is, but he, he's putting the needles in me. And I immediately started crying for 90 minutes. I said, God have mercy on my soul. Wow. And I, was, I, I was a Christian growing up, but I lost my faith in college. I was a history major. I saw man's inhumanity, man. So I was seeking something spiritually to fill that void. And for me, it was yoga and meditation for many years. Um, and then I became a Christian um, again, I guess, or however you want to say it, returned my faith, not by any volitional effort. It was, I believe God came into my life because I was, I was, um, I just believed it was like lightning struck and that occurred uh, in my mid forties. And so it's a, it, that, that journey of, of uh, that spiritualism helps me anchor me. And I think it's something I've always wanted. And I saw it through different avenues and things. And then, and God, the, my God that came to me, um, transformed me, not by my choice. So that's, that's the spiritual side of things. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> God and I are really tight. I don't know how you get through life without having that foundation. There's just too many things that I don't believe in coincidences anymore. Sure. Um, but a lot of that takes maturity because you've tried every external thing on the planet to make yourself feel important and significant. And eventually, you, 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 I think you just finally get there and say, you know what, it is what it is. I, I hope you like me. But if you don't, I'll, I'm OK with that because it's just too hard to keep singing and dancing for everybody else. You know, I agree. So, congratulations. I have I have watched you through the years going, what happens? I, I want whatever he got, because you can tell you're so comfortable with yourself now. And that's all it was. It was just insecurity. That's what we're all doing, you know, fighting our insecurities. And I thought, oh, my gosh. He has just, I've never seen anything like that before. So I really appreciate that. Um, so um, I always ask at the end, like, tell us something we don't know about you. You really were a great dancer. How, where'd you learn that? And then this art, you're not kidding. The, your art is serious art. So tell us about that. It's my passion. Um, I was, it, it, I, I was, I was doing a lot of abstract work. Now I'm recently doing one because my wife has asked me to do it, but uh, I've always been fascinated with, with art uh, and design and museums and everything. And uh, initially when I did my first textbooks, they just, the, the publisher said, look, Hey, I to, to get the book deal signed. I said, I'll do my own drawings. And I didn't know what I was doing. And I finally did it all digitally and they came out. Okay. But, um, in the last few years, I started to really move from abstraction and started to trust my hand. And I've dived deeper and deeper into rep representational work. And every morning I get up, I, uh, work out and I paint before I go to work. And it's just part of this, uh, if you will call it the meditation side, it's a meditative part of my life. And it is amazing. And uh, I encourage all of you guys to to paint. No, I don't know. I love it. I, I, I learned it through YouTube during the pandemic. The pandemic was great because uh, I spent that time watching some YouTube videos and learning. And go to Patreon if you haven't done Patreon it's um it's not well organized but it's 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 youtube and patreon are ways to learn everything my god i learned all my artistic techniques through that are you selling your artwork 
No, but I recently uh, um, donate. I was the chairman last year for this Dallas uh, County um, uh, Children's Advocacy Center, which is to help with uh, child abuse cases, uh, horrible child abuse cases in Dallas County. And uh, I was the honorary chair with my wife. And, you know, it's it's an art for advocacy where they um, you donate um, you, you, people, artists donate pieces. And I said, I'll donate my piece. And I've never, and it was great because I never met all this community of artists, but bam, I made, I made friends with all these artists and my piece sold like in five minutes for uh, max bid, which is uh, that you can buy it for twice the, whatever they, they forced me to cap at 10,000. It sold at 20,000. So, so I, I sold that if you will count that, but it, it, it all goes to charity. So, yeah. Holy cow. Somebody bought it for $20,000. Yeah, and so next year, this this year, excuse me, this 2023 now, I'm going to do a 10-foot piece that my goal is to do this on the live auction. So out of 80 pieces, they allow five for the live auction. They turned me down last year. My arrogance said that I should be on the live auction. But this year, I'm going to really, I said, I told them, look, guys, I've sold this thing in five minutes. And even all the other artists said, Autumn told me this was like the best piece they've seen. So my goal is, I, I already have the vision of how I'm going to do this 10-foot piece. It's going to be I'm hoping they will say yes. It, it's based on the 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 curatorial committee to say yes or no to it. It's ten feet tall, ten feet wide, and five feet high. It's two canvases, five by five. It will be um, what I'm planning to do is these children that have gone through the suffering. They uh, it's an idea from what this woman did last year. I'm going to have them work on and paint the backgrounds and the the acrylic. So you'll know that what you're hanging in your room has been touched by the children that you have touched by buying this because money goes all, all goes to them. And so then I'm going to do a, a web and network with birds and flowers, which I've painted a lot. And those are going to be realistic on the abstract background. It's going to be called hope or hope eternal, because that's the symbolism of the flight and the symbol of the, of the flowers blossoming. Because you know, when a child has been sexually abused and, and physically abused, and it's just horrific that this is that you're going to hang that in your home that will show show this, you know, flight and blossoming. So that's sort of my idea. Wow. Well, you know what? If plastic surgery doesn't work out for you, you can always fall back on this. Right? <laughs> I don't know. I'll be a starving artist. I hate to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so so we'll, we'll wrap it up now. But is there any um, closing comments? Um, how can people reach you? Any advice for others coming up? Uh, you know what? Uh, be passionate about it. Don't If there's something you don't like, don't do it. You know, if, and that's, if you love it, don't, don't let someone else tell you not to do it carve your own way. Like I was a history major in college and people thought, why are you a history major? Well, trans, trans, you know, Steve Jobs talks about, if you haven't seen the Steve Jobs, um, when he talks about connecting the dots backwards. Uh, mm, yes. does, yeah, it's a great, I always tell uh, uh, to people to watch that because I didn't know that could actually allow me to write books so fast. Um, and it, it just follow your heart and your passion. Just do what you like. Don't worry about someone else telling you that you suck or you're stupid and you shouldn't do that because you know, if you love it, you're going to be, you're going to get better at it. And, and that's, that's, those are my parting words, you know? Well, that's fabulous. Thank you so much, Dr. Sam Lamb. Um, I hope to see you at a meeting soon yeah. and that'll wrap it up for, for us for Beauty in the Biz. If you'd be so kind to subscribe to Beauty in the Biz so you don't miss future episodes, that'd be terrific. Please share this with your colleagues and staff. If you've got any questions or feedback for me, you can always leave them at my website at katherinemaley.com. Dr. Lamb's website, is it Lamb Facial Plastic? Plastics with an S.com, yeah. Plastics.com. Uh, it would be Dr. Lamb, D-R-L-A-M, at lambfacialplastics.com. Gotcha. All righty. And then if you want to DM me, you can um, reach me at Catherine Maley, uh, MBA at Instagram. What's your Instagram handle? I've got many, but uh, LF, my, if you want to follow my art, yeah. which has nothing to do with business. It's Sam Lamb, MD. Uh, I post every day a new piece of art. If you want to follow my facial, it's LFP Dallas, as in Lamb Facial Plastics, LFP Dallas. And my hair is Hair TX. And then my skincare is Ova Skincare, OVA Skincare. But... Dear Lord, do you ever sleep? <laughs> <laughs> Six hours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. We'll talk to you again. Take care. The fastest way to success is to model other successful surgeons who have what you want, but you can only see their results, not the path they took to get there. So you continue to jump from one thing to another, hoping to find something that will work for you too. 
but it rarely does. So try this shortcut instead. It's guaranteed to move you forward. I compiled my intellectual property to grow cosmetic revenues, everything I've gleaned over the years into one playbook of the most successful practices and what they do to win. Go to CosmeticPracticeVault.com and let's grow your cosmetic revenues.